Hello, everybody. I'm uh, very excited to introduce our final invited speaker today. Um, Percy Liang is an assistant professor at Stanford University. Um, his research is in machine learning and natural language processing, and both of these communities uh, recognize him as the rising superstar. Um, in They've both showered him with awards, like in the last, he's pretty much won every award there is in both communities. Um, for example, he won the EMNLP Best Paper Award twice, the ICML Best Paper Award, the COLD Best Paper Award, the ACL Best Paper Award, and the Ichikai Computer and Thought Award. And all the awards I just listed were just in the last two years, and there were many before that. <coughs> Percy's research lab has uh, a very ambitious but exciting goal. Um, he's trying to build trustworthy agents that can communicate effectively with people and improve over time through interaction. And um, to achieve this goal, he does a lot of research in the many aspects, uh, you know, many problems that uh, along this path, including question answering, dialogue systems, program induction, interactive learning, and reliable machine learning. And if you paid attention at this AAAI, you may have noticed uh, a recurrent theme that we've had, uh, especially in the invited talks, and that is that people complained that the community, especially machine learning, is focusing too much on just accuracy. And this has been mentioned in, in many of, uh, several of the talks. And as Zubin Gramani put it, um, he said, it requires a cultural shift to get away from focusing on accuracy alone, because it leaves too much on the table. Well, I'm excited to tell you that Percy Liang is exactly at the forefront of this very movement. And so let's welcome him here at AAAI. All right, thanks, Killian, for the <coughs> kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for uh, sticking with us to the last day, and especially in the early in the morning. Um, so this talk is going to be about evaluation, and the title might seem a little bit strange because it has both machine learning and AI. And whenever I teach the AI class at Stanford, I, the, the, the first day the question is always, what's the difference? And for, for the purpose of this talk, um, I'm going to think about AI as kind of a set of behaviors that we wanted um, a system to be able to have, such as you know, perception or language, and machine learning as kind of the set of tools that we want uh, to get there. And I think part of the, the problem that Killian was alluding to, um, this dissatisfaction stems from the fact that you know, the two are kind of conflated. And um, this is going to be somewhat of a machine learning centric uh, uh, talk, just to kind of warn you. But I think it will be kind of taking a critical look at some of the deficiency of the ways we think about machine learning. Um, so you know, needless to say, machine learning has been you know, really dominant over the last you know, 10 or I mean, 20 years, especially notably deep learning and that kind of less latest, uh, you know, hype craze, you know, in speech, uh, language, game playing, vision, you know, uh, machine learning undoubtedly has been um, a pr prominent player in uh, the successes. And in some places, it really has kind of, uh, you know, seems to have outperformed humans. So image recognition, 2015, um, you know, the, the, the best systems were um, matching or exceeding human error rates. And of course, the media you know, t loves this, so they go off and uh, write an article about it. Um, but, but if you take a closer look, I mean, it, it seems like something is wrong, right? So those of you familiar with adversarial examples, you have an image which is uh, labeled correctly as a temple by a state of art classifier. You can perform imperceptible perturbations on it, and you can get that, um, this following image to be labeled as an ostrich. So no human would ever make this mistake. And this is kind of not a one isolated incident. You can put glasses on yourself to get yourself uh, recognized as a celebrity. You can put po uh, stickers on a stop sign and get a, a detector to think that it's a um, speed limit sign and so on. So obviously these have kind of security implications as well. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to think about these as kind of a signal that we're doing kind of something um, wrong. So whatever the visual, human visual system is, we're not doing that. Um, in language processing, there's a kind of a similar story. So two years ago, we released this uh, question answering benchmark, um, and which I'll talk about a little bit later. And over the last two years, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, excitement and progress on it. And just uh, in the last year, um, 
it appears that Alibaba and Microsoft have um, beat humans at reading comprehension. And I have no idea why a robot from Ex Machina appears in this article, but there, there you have it. Um, but you know, despite all that you know, uh, success on the leaderboard, um, last year we had a paper, I think is, is the screen cut off? No, it's only on my laptop. Okay, so uh, last year we had a paper that showed even if you take on one of these state of our systems, it takes a passage, here's a question, what can an enthusiastic teacher be to a young student, and answers correctly, very inf uh, influential. Um, but if you uh, play some games and add a distracting sentence at the end of the, the passage, you can actually very easily trick uh, these systems to uh, producing the wrong answer. Um, in this case, an unenthusiastic teacher can be troubling to a young student, and it just, you know, the, the state of the art method that allegedly surpasses human performance now outputs troubling, which is indeed troubling. Um, so it's clear that, you know, machine learning based uh, AI systems have made huge successes in kind of certain narrow domains. But, you know, broadly speaking, there is still uh, a huge gap, as these uh, examples illustrate. So now the question is, you know, how do you close this gap? What are the steps we should take? And it, it seems like, I mean, everyone has kind of a different opinion. So, you know, the deep learning, people have a certain kind of, uh, kind of uh, extensions of deep learning. Um, Josh Tenenbaum has been kind of proclaiming Bayesian models and probabilistic programming for some time. You can think about knowledge representations, the sexual relation learning. Um, it's all kind of different paradigms. So we really kind of need an objective evaluation metric, um, which so far has been kind of accuracy, but we've seen to kind of fail us in many uh, different ways. So one idea is to kind of, uh, you know, take a page from uh, Hector Levesque's book, who um, wrote this uh, eloquent article in 2013 on our best behavior, um, which suggests that we really need to stress test our systems. We need to design tests which cannot be simply uh, you know, um, de design tests that cannot be um, passed by simply using quote unquote cheap tricks. So he proposed the following Winograd schema, which has um, got a lot of attention. Um, so here the idea is that you have a sentence, the dog chased the cat, which run up a, ran up a tree. It waited at the top, and the goal is to figure out does it refer to the dog or the cat? So in this case, it's the, uh, should be the cat, right? Um, <laughs> And what about if you have um, it weighted at the bottom? Then it should be the dog, hopefully. So this is designed to be easy for humans, even early in the morning. Um, OK, so just, just for fun, uh, so last night I did, OK, so let's take the, the cheapest, the dirtiest trick out of the book and see what we can do. So here's what we want to figure out um, this, uh, what if refers to. So I'm just going to use Google. I'm going to type in the cat weighted at the top. Okay, so you get some nice pictures of cats. But you also get a number. So it, there's 23 million results. You type the dog weighted at the top. And you get 4 million. So okay, let's conclude that the answer is the cat, which happens to be right in this case. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, you know, double check uh, the other case. Um, so type in the cat weighted at the bottom. Um, type in the dog weighted at the bottom, and again, the counts alone show that reveal kind of reveal the right answer. So it seems like Google is really smart, isn't it? Um, so I only tested on one example, so just take the result at face value. I'm not claiming that this is a, any sort of solution to Winograd or it should be the solution, but this is just an illustration that you know statistics just don't care, right? So you can come up with all these stories about you know, we need our systems to have common sense knowledge, grounding, logical reasoning, and you kind of list the desiderata. But if you're going to participate in empirical evaluation, you know, it's, 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 it's like mother nature. Um, um, maybe this is not a good image to show uh, right now, but um, it's, it, it just kind of, uh, f if there are superficial correlations, it will just happily go after them. And this is kind of uh, statistics plus empirical evaluation just kind of suffers from um, this. Uh, this artifact. Okay, so to take a deeper look at kind of what's going on, I, I think the central problem, if we're going to kind of pursue an empirical route, is the kind of the philosophy or paradigm inside machine learning that has been so deeply ingrained in us, right? And that, that is kind of that, the fact that you have training sets and you have test sets. 
and the kind of the, the convention, the standards, the status quo is that you just randomly split your training into your data set into train and test. Um, you're training and then you evaluate on test, and you're not looking at your test set, right? So that should be okay. But, but it, it turns out it's not enough, right? Because any expressive enough model, you know, nearest neighbors, the neural nets, with enough data, it will do the job. And it looks like you, you gather a lot of data and it looks like it's doing well, right? Is you can fit a kind of squiggly curve to this and it'll have low error. Um, so what we really need is some sort of harder if evaluation metric. And I, I, in this talk, I'm gonna kind of advocate for kind of thinking about you know, extrapolation, where you know, the training distribution is not the test distribution. So a kind of an example of this, suppose I got a bunch of examples which were kind of um, to the left. Um, if I were kind of learning kind of the right thing, I should be able to kind of extrapolate to um, examples which are kind of on the x-axis, which are totally outside my domain. And this is kind of, I think, a key, um, key point is that in order to be robust or to kind of show the types of generalizations that you know, are typical um, of humans, you need to kind of um, to really stress the extrapolation. And um, this kind of evaluation will also kind of put pressure that you actually get kind of a more correct model. So we know all models are wrong, but at least it hopefully will push us in the right direction. So two kind of uh, just you know anecdotal examples, right? So um, sometimes when you're a machine learning researcher, you kind of almost get lost in you know the, the millions of parameters and kind of don't appreciate kind of the model the power of kind of models, which you know if you're um, thinking kind of scientifically is, is very natural, right? Once you have to kind of understand the laws of physics, you can make all sorts of predictions which are outside kind of what you quote unquote trained on. Um, and another example from language, if you kind of understand the semantics of the blue block or right of blue block, you should be able to kind of put things together and understand longer sentences. So you shouldn't need to train on sentences that all look alike. You should be able to kind of extrapolate from short to long. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to sketch out some ideas along two directions. One is trying to apply pressure on the current algorithms um, by thinking about harder evaluation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about you know, models that uh, we've been playing around with that can extrapolate. So I should warn you that a lot, most of this work is actually kind of um, published and just kind of I was emailing students last night and try to get results so it's very fresh um, so hopefully it will be um, interesting both to you and me so so let's start with reading comprehension so as we showed earlier we have examples of uh, passages you add a distracting sentence and you can cause state-of-the-art models to just go completely off the rails so um, one thing that we did when we started the squad benchmark, which in retrospect was you know, a really crucial move, was to have a test set for this benchmark be hidden and require that anyone participating submit their models to our kind of uh, public um, repository. Um, we, so we designed this uh, website called CodeLab um, you know, separately, but we used it for this competition. So as a result, we have everyone's models. And it was actually extremely easy to run um, all the models on not just the original uh, evaluation, but also the adversarial evaluation where we have this uh, sentence appended at the end. And we see that across the board, accuracy just kind of plummet from you know, 70s and 80s to now kind of 50s and you know, 60s. So this is kind of a systemic problem. It's not a particularity of any particular model. And I should say that uh, in contrast to adversarial examples in vision, these, um, this data set is static. It's not even trying to target a particular model. So these are kind of uh, these things are kind of pretty robust, and of course humans um, do, uh, do not get fooled by this. So one thing you might imagine, okay, if you're a machine learning guy, is okay. Let's what well, we have these examples that we're not doing well on. Why don't we just add them back in the training set? Well, not the literally exact ones, but you know the, the similar ones. Um, so if we train the model on adversary examples which are appended. We see that we can be robust against these. So accuracy dips a little bit, but it's still kind of in the ballpark. But if you come with, um, if you prepend the sentence instead, now accuracy again plummets to the, the 30s, right? So this is kind of a problem with uh, that we simply cannot patch these issues. So this kind of the, 
empirical grind of saying, okay, here's a problem, let's go you know, add some examples and fix it, S simply kind of won't address the systemic issue. And so what's the problem here? The problem I think is partly with the, you know, um, our fault. It's, it's kind of with the data set. And it's, it allows cheap tricks to kind of uh, come into play, right? So if you have a question, who was blah, 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 and you have a passage that really only has one person in it, then you don't need to read the question. You just answer, you know, Jefferson. And so in reality, it's not this simple, but, you know, it shows you kind of, you can find plausible answers by just kind of doing uh, shallow keyword matching. So how can we design a kind of harder uh, test that can, um, you know, guard against this cheap trick? Um, so we've been doing this. This is kind of very f uh, fresh work. We've been trying to gather, uh, quote, unquote, negative examples. So we took the same documents. We asked uh, Turkers to create questions which have plausible answers in the passage but do not ultimately get answered by the, uh, on the passage. And so we have about 20,000 of these. There were originally 100,000 of the questions, and currently we're just doing standard training tests split for diagnostics, which I said uh, we shouldn't be doing ultimately, but there you have it. Um, so if we do this, so here is an example of a passage about um, um, a climate ch uh, change, and you know we have uh, what the underlying learning model of policy making, blah, 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 policy, political response will be, is, is being doubted. Um, and here's a question, what will be assured, assured because of political response to linear model? One of these state of our models uh, correctly predicts that uh, this question cannot be answered. But it also still fails um, on some questions. So if you have Victoria has about uh, 63,000 full-time teachers and you ask how many janitors it has, it happily produces uh, the number. So it doesn't really know that janitors and teachers are not you know, synonyms. Um, so there's still some kind of work to do and kind of just rough numbers. The original uh, accuracy of this model is around 80%. With these kind of harder negatives, now the accuracy is 60%. So I think this is, you know, kind of interesting challenge and hopefully will buy us another year before deep learning methods uh, kind of cream this one as well. Um, so, so that was kind of uh, and just kind of a brief illustration of how you can you know, manually go in and look at the domain and try to add examples. We're also thinking how can you kind of automatically do this? And this might have a kind of a flavor of, of uh, GANs, uh, but it's kind of actually much simpler than that. Um, so here's another NLP task which uh, suffers from kind of cheap tricks. So the task, uh, this is Rock Stories by Nazarin et al. Um, and the task is you're given some story. Karen was assigned a roommate for her first year of college. Her roommate asked her to go to a nearby city for a concert. Karen happily agreed. The show was absolutely exhilarating. And then you're asked to predict which of these endings is the right one. You're, or you're given an ending and you're asked, is this a right ending or a wrong ending? So Karen became good friends with her roommate. That makes sense. Karen hated her roommate. Probably doesn't make sense. So again, this is a task that on the surface, it seems like you really need to understand semantics and world knowledge. And, know kind of what's going on. Um, but if you kind of project onto, let's just do an empirical evaluation, what happens? Um, so the state of art gets, you know, 75%, um, which is, you know, it's not um, random, but it's also not, you know, solving the problem either. But, but what's actually more interesting is that if you just look at the ending and not at the context at all, you can get 72 which is, uh, this, so this is a result by Roy Schwartz and all from UW. And this is the, the kind of epitome of cheap trick. You're not even reading the question, how can you possibly know whether this is the right ending or wrong ending? Um, and the RNN gets something less than that. So if you're actually an honest attempt at solving the problem, does worse. So we have this uh, kind of idea that we've been playing around, um, which is kind of reminiscent of boosting. So the idea is, can we make the, the data set kind of harder? Um, so the idea is that we're going to define some superficial features. For example, ones that only look at the last sentence, don't even look at the context. Um, and then we're going to use the superficial features to reweight these training examples. So the details I'm not going to, I'm going to kind of skip over. And then we're going to uh, basically use that as our train and test distribution. So it's kind of harder distribution. So we're not changing the examples, we're just kind of reweighting them. And the idea is that this ensures that the model that only uses superficials um, is uh, getting kind of bad performance. So in, this basically says, you know, it tries to make sure that the zero vector using the superficial features uh, under a linear classifier has kind of, uh, is, uh, is optimal. 
Um, okay, so what do we, what happens here? So originally we saw that this really cheap trick was able to defeat this uh, you know, RNN, um, but in the weighted distribution we see that you know, the, rev uh, the opposite is true, that it reveals that the n-gram features are kind of really not doing anything, which is uh, closer to the truth. And this RNN, I mean, it's still not very good, it's only 65, but at least it's kind of, um, you know, ruling out this kind of thing that you probably should, really shouldn't be doing if you care about um, not the task, but language understanding. Okay, so um, now let's turn a bit from language to vision. And the, the interesting thing about vision is that there's actually kind of a more systematic way that you can produce harder examples, these adversary examples. Where in language, because language is discrete, it's actually harder to kind of reliably produce these. And in vision, it's kind of a different challenge here. It's more of a computational challenge, as we'll uh, see you later. Okay, so these adversary examples clearly have security implications, but you know they're also a fact that you know the models are really learning the wrong thing, which is I think of interest um, here. So to set up things a little bit more formally, um, so suppose we're trying to learn a binary classifier, which is a, some deep neural network, um, and uh, the function is going to classify positive if it's positive and negative if it's negative. And the goal, so the defender is trying to do this. The attacker is going to um, give an input image, uh, which let's say is classified negative. It's going to try to find a perturbation such that this uh, so defender is going to classify it as positive as possible, subject to the constraint that you're not going to change the image by too much. And this is basically saying every pixel is changed by at most epsilon. Okay, so that's the goal. And um, with all kind of security uh, games, it quickly turns into a cat and mouse. So over the last, um, uh, let's say, uh, three years or so, there's been over 100 papers on, um, at least on archive, basically proposing new attacks, proposing new defenses, proposing attacks that you know, shoot down those defenses and so on. My favorite is one that um, someone posted an article saying no need to worry about adversary examples in autonomous vehicles. And then f um, f first of all, if you're doing autonomous vehicles, you should be always worrying. But five days later, um, OpenAI had a result that just broke this defense. So um, be careful what you um, say. So. How can we put an end to uh, this? How do we kind of get a, a definitive answer? Can we get robustness against all attacks? And there's a related work on, in kind of formal verification that tries to do this, but you know, currently the scalability isn't um, you know, so great. Um, so, so what do we do? So here is the picture of you know, what we do. We have uh, an input image X here, and now projected into you know, two dimensions. And the adversary gets to play any point in this box. Um, this is the L infinity uh, ball of uh, radius epsilon. And in particular, the level curves show the function f that the adversary is trying to maximize to uh, get a, the example classified as incorrectly as possible. And so adversary wants to play this, this point. Um, unfortunately, computing a uh, comma point is actually NP-hard, so you can't do this. So people typically use things like a uh, fast line gradient method, which basically compute a gradient from the current point and just march off into the corner of, of this box. And clearly, this is a kind of a heuristic, and it gets points which are often kind of much less suboptimal, much more suboptimal than the optimal point. Okay, and then you can do like some more sophisticated methods, but you know, you're, any sort of attack that you come up with is not going to be exactly the optimum um, so what can we do about this? So if we wanted to get guard against all attacks, you need to kind of uh, be able to reason about all attacks, right? So um, what we decided to do is uh, we can't compute a opt exactly, but maybe we can upper bound it. So the idea is that instead of looking at the gradient only at the current uh, image, x, we're going to look at the gradients over the entire ball, and we can write this bound that the worst thing that the attacker can do is upper bounded by some function that involves a uniform bound of all the gradients in this, in this ball. So this is actually still intractable. Um, we can make a little bit of progress on um, two layer neural networks, um, which look like this. And I'll kind of, in the interest of time, just gloss over the details, but ultimately you can bound this as an optimize, write this bound as an optimization problem um, which uh, happens to be SDP. 
And SAPs you can solve kind of in polynomial at times, so this actually gives you an upper bound. So I should stress that you know, this is actually kind of some of the cases where having convexity and guaranteeing optimality is actually crucial because um, you don't want just to, um, any sort of heuristic an adversary can kind of uh, you know, get around and you don't get guarantees. So one thing that's kind of interesting about this upper bound is that you can, I, it provides you a certificate. So if you give me a network, I can tell you what the maximum damage that an adversary can do. But also, I can actually take this uh, uh, certificate and plug it in into the objective. And what this is doing is it's saying, at training time, I want to find parameters of the network which have both a good training loss, but also um, are kind of robust under this kind of certificate. So this is something that's kind of interesting that you know this idea of certification, if you think kind of formal verification, you're just kind of uh, you know s stuck with whatever kind of uh, model you get. But um, here, we're actually kind of optimizing the model and the certificate at the same time. So some kind of results here. Uh, so if you took an off-the-shelf network and we computed our bound, uh, so the x-axis shows the amount of perturbations and the y-axis shows the error rate, um, we see that our bound is a lot better than previous ones, but it's actually still pretty vacuous. So it says that if you perturb um, the pixels by around 10%, um, your error rate is at most 100%. So that's a great guarantee to have. Um, but but bef remember I said you can actually train against the certificate. So if we take this certificate and include it in the optimization, now you can actually, if it's basically kind of pushing down this upper bound and you can actually get you know, non-vacuous bounds. So now we can get uh, error rates of you know, 35 uh, you know, percent, which is still really bad for MNIST, uh, but you know, nonetheless, at least we have something. And so, um, so I should mention that um, about uh, five days after we post, um, submitted this to, to iClear, um, uh, Zico and Eric from CMU actually had another interesting idea, um, which is, uh, at a high level, the same kind of uh, idea of having upper bounds, but their upper bound was based on linear programs instead of SDPs. And the trade-off is that while SDPs are kind of tighter in general, LPs are kind of simpler, which allow you to kind of scale up to deeper networks, and ultimately they were able to get kind of tighter um, guarantees on error. Um, but the two are actually kind of complementary. So if you train using the SCP method and evaluate using SCP, you do better. Um, and same with LP, but if you train on one and you test on the, uh, or evaluate uh, robustness on the other, you get kind of vacuous bounds. So we're kind of trying to figure out if there's a way to kind of combine the best of wo both worlds here. Okay, so to summarize this section, um, you know, the convexity actually, you know, you might think that in a kind of an era of deep learning, you know, what use is convexity? It turns out that if you kind of want these kind of robustness guarantees, it actually, uh, pays to have you know uh, something that you can actually solve exactly. Um, verification is hard in general, but if you can optimize the certificate, that's kind of gives you one point of leverage um, that you can exploit. Um, but you know, in some sense, we're still this technology is still a little bit immature. I think there's still a lot to do. We're you know not scaling up to um, ImageNet quite yet, um, but you know we're trying to make progress on this. Okay, so let me shift gears now to talk about some models that um, you know, extrapolate. Um, so in order to do extrapolation, you need models. Um, you can't just you know, do nearest neighbors. Um, and uh, you need, you need uh, inductive bias, which we kind of all knew all along from machine learning that you know, good performance is some combination of inductive bias plus you know, data. And despite kind of the, the rhetoric that you know, neural nets are kind of these black box things, there's actually a lot of kind of inductive bias you know, um, built into them. For example, even just take the simple ideas like convolutions. Right? Convolutions it says something about kind of locality is important in kind of images and there's kind of a uniformity to these patches. Um, Attention-based mechanisms, which are really popular in NLP for doing things like uh, you know, machine translation, uh, say that you know, the, the, sequen the word that you're generating at a particular point in time only really depends on kind of a, uh, maybe a kind of quote unquote sparse subset of the input. So if you're translating a 2D aunt, um, you probably should be kind of attending to or looking at student but not the whole sentence. 
So there's, there's kind of a lot of the progress actually in deep learning has been about creating architectures which incorporate some of these um, new inductive biases. Um, so, but now let's talk about uh, tasks. So one task that we've been looking at recently is style or attribute transfer in actual language. So this is kind of inspired by so kind of the pretty um, you know, amazing kind of images that you see coming out of the vision community. And um, as language people, we're always jealous that they kind of get better visuals than we, are, we do. Um, so maybe you can do something in kind of natural language. So, so the idea here is that um, we're going to take as training data um, some reviews of, let's say, restaurants um, paired with their sentiment, positive and negative reviews. Um, so that's the training data. At test time, we're going to not do that task because that's called sentiment classification. We're going to take a positive review and try to see if we can transform it into a negative review but somehow still preserve the content. Right? So the train and test, um, in this case, aren't even not only different distributions, but they're not even the same kind of type signature. Um, and again, this is something that we're interested in because we really, really want to stress the, the ideally if the model can do this task, it probably has learned something about decoupling um, content from style. Um, so, so the first thing we did was actually um, something you know, kind of uh, pretty simple. And the idea is this uh, two-step procedure. So first, we're going to look over our corpus of positive and negative reviews. And we're going to just use simple kind of frequency counts to detect what are engrams that are most kind of negative and which ones are engrams which are most positive. Okay? And then we're going to um, basically, given a negative review that we want to transform to a positive review, we're going to strip out all the attributes, all the engrams which we have extracted as negative. And now we have this, what we think of as kind of capturing the content. And then we're going to give the positive label, and we're going to train a system um, to basically take that positive label and then insert words which are kind of positive that kind of make sense here. OK, so notably, we, we still don't get um, examples of you know, negative reviews and positive reviews. So we're going to have to train the system using some sort of autoencoder you know, uh, objective. So the thing to mention here is that there's kind of this inductive bias, again, the locality, which kind of, I think, shows up over and over again, is that you know, this uh, um, your kind of assumption that attribute and style are localized um, in the text. Not always true, but uh, to a first order approximation, it seems like it's a useful inductive bias to have. Um, so we tested on three data sets, uh, Yelp reviews, image captions, and Amazon reviews. Um, which are standard kind of in the text uh, you know, style transfer. Um, and here are some you know, results that we have. So we did human evaluation here um, because you know, there's kind of no, you generate a sentence and you know, how do you assess it, assess it otherwise. Um, so we evaluate whether humans have humans rate, whether it's grammatical, um, whether it preserves the content, and whether it has a target attribute. And here we're comparing uh, previous methods. I'm not going to go into these in detail, but these were kind of based on more generic, uh, um, let's say, general purpose a kind of machinery like uh, you know, GANs, which actually instantly turned out to be you know, really hard to train. And then we have a bunch of methods. So delete and retrieve is um, you know, kind of our, our best method. And we see that the success rate is, uh, which means that you know, both the uh, uh, sorry, all content, um, grammaticality, and preserving target attribute have to be high for it to be deemed success. These rates are much higher than you know, what we saw in uh, the uh, previous uh, state of art across all these data sets. And you know, this is really to say that kind of the inductive bias uh, really helped us out here. And so kind of some qualitative results. So if you want to transform this sentence, um, previous results kind of, uh, you know, try to do something but don't really make a whole lot of sense, whereas our result, it's not perfect, um, but it's, it does something kind of more, much more sensible. Okay, so, so now I'm gonna move on to um, the last part of my talk. And this was, when I submitted my abstract, I wasn't planning on talking about this, um, but it turned out to be kind of uh, interesting from a kind of this extrapolation point of view. So this is a separate project where we're trying to explore the problem of 
can neural networks actually do any kind of logical reasoning, quote unquote? And you know, what's, uh, what's, uh, we decided to do is uh, to tackle the problem of SAT solving, which is kind of the canonical um, logical reasoning problem. So you're given a formula, and can you produce the assignment of the variables that make the formula evaluate to true, if that's possible, or return unsat if that's not possible. So the model uh, uh, that we developed um, was aimed to capture kind of this inductive bias of um, um, belief propagation or survey propagation, these methods, message passing methods, which have been kind of uh, surprisingly useful for solving um, random SAT instances. And the basic idea is that we have a set of literals and we have a set of clauses. And at each time step, we're going to compute an embedding for each literal in every clause. And over each time step, um, the clauses are going to pass messages to the literals and vice versa. So the embeddings are going to go in an update over time. And at the end, we're just going to look at the embedding of um, uh, the, the literals and try to basically do a binary classification to see whether, um, sorry, we're going to actually aggregate over everything and try to predict whether this instance as a whole is uh, satisfiable or not. So it seems like a kind of a crazy idea, um, but nonetheless, we'll try it out. So um, we t train on, so when you're talking about SAT, you need to figure out some distribution, right? So in, f in some sense, if you cho choose the easy distribution, then predicting SAT is you know, kind of trivial. Um, so we tried to choose like a, a kind of a hard distribution. So what we did is we generated kind of random instances of uh, SAT or unsat, and then we um, basically you know did a bunch of kind of local manipulations to this. So we ended up with these pairs where one formula was satisfiable, and such that if you change one literal, it becomes unsat. Okay, so you th think that if you're kind of just training some vague classifier over this, um, it would be very hard to detect um, whether something's unsat or sat because. You know, there's only kind of one literal that's different out of a possible kind of, you know, let's say uh, tens or hundreds of uh, literals. Um, and then test time, we're going to use the same distribution for now because we're not even sure if we can, uh, you know, do this task. Um, so the first, uh, you know, we got some results and the test accuracy was, you know, 88%, which is actually surprised us that it was kind of so high given, you know, this distribution, you know, is, doesn't seem, you know, quite trivial. Um, so what we did next is we were trying to understand, okay, what is the network actually, you know, doing? Um, so here I'm showing a plot of the kind of embeddings, uh, or sorry, the votes of the, the, the literals for every time step over time. So red is kind of a large uh, value and um, gray is kind of a value around zero. And this two by 20 block shows that for every one of these literals, x1, um, x1 bar, x2, x bar, x2 bar, and so on, what is kind of its vote. And we see that, you know, the, you know, for a while, kind of, it seems like nothing happens, and there's this kind of phase transition, and then it kind of converges to some sort of pattern. If you look at the pattern at the end, it seems like for every variable, one of the literals is kind of darker than the other. So this kind of suggests a kind of a very simple way of perhaps decoding assignments where you just choose a literal that has a kind of a higher activation. And if you do this, it turns out of the places where the model predicts SAT, you can actually decode um, the satisfying assignment uh, in 90% of the cases. And this was kind of really surprising to us because this is kind of an example of extrapolation. So remember at training time, we're given this formula and we tell the network, here's a one bit, this is SAT or unsat. And then by draining basically just you know, standard back propagation, we're actually able to you know, have the network um, kind of, dare I say, kind of discover an algorithm for kind of computing, you know, satisfying uh, you know, assignments. Um, and we also looked at kind of uh, additional extrapolation. So what happens when you look at larger instances or train it for more iterations? So because this is kind of a message passing algorithm, it's natural to think, well, if it were really a message passing algorithm, you should be able to kind of run it for longer and it should be doing, shouldn't completely go off the rails. Uh, and we see that to be the case. So on the x-axis is the number of iterations we're running, and the y-axis is kind of the, uh, the accuracy. And over time, 
we see that uh, not only does a, you know, the, does a kind of dynamic stabilize, but actually it gets better. So this is kind of interesting because normally the conventional wisdom is if you train on a distribution, you should really test with that. Otherwise, you have no guarantees and things are likely to go off the rails, think of the typical domain adaptation problem. But here we're deliberately making the test conditions different by training for longer. Um, and it's still kind of, you know, getting actually not just, not as, not degrading, but actually improving the results. So we were able to generalize this to a larger instance. So when we, this was trained on 40 uh, variables and we can push this up to um, even, you know, 200 literals, uh, 200 variables. And of course the, you know, the accuracy degrades over time. Um, but, you know, it doesn't drop to kind of zero. So there's some kind of extrapolative power um, still built in. So this was kind of pretty, uh, you know, intriguing. Um, we also looked at, um, um, so we trained on these kind of random SAT instances. We took a bunch of kind of canonical MP uh, complete problems like, you know, cake clique, uh, coloring, um, dominating SAT and so on. And we encoded these in SAT. So this is definitely a different distribution. And we ran the, the solver, which was trained on just kind of these random set instances. And we see that, you know, the, we can actually still solve a lot of the, the problems. I mean, not, not all, all the time, but enough times to uh, give us some belief that this is actually learning something related to SAT solving rather than <coughs> doing basic uh, heuristics. Um, and I will also point out an anecdotally that when we ran kind of survey propagation, on the, this kind of setting, it uh, did not work at all. So it's not just kind of mimicking uh, survey propagation. Okay, so this is kind of still, we're still in the process of kind of trying to figure, understand these results, but I just kind of, I was really excited about this and wanted to kind of share some of the, um, the results that we had. Okay, so let me try to um, wrap up now. So I think evaluation is kind of uh, really at the, you know, central to kind of our ability to make progress because if you can kind of measure it, then it's hard to kind of be kind of rigorous and scientific about it. And what I like about empirical evaluation is that you get to kind of be agnostic to um, the kind of the religion. Um, you know, you could be, you know, Bayesian or, you know, a deep learning person or a logic, but ultimately, you know, you can have, um, you can know, kind of play the same game. Um, and this is kind of a strong tradition from even kind of Alan Turing came up with the Turing test because he did not want to get into, you know, these philosophical debates about, you know, um, what in, um, you know, what was intelligence and can we just kind of make it uh, more of a kind of empirical or behavioral test to the Winograd schema, which, you know, Hector Levesque um, was also trying to create a, um, a, a benchmark that really tested intelligence. But one thing to kind of, I think, which is the main takeaway, I think, from this, this talk is that you have to kind of be very careful when you do empirical evaluation. So here's some examples of you know, image captioning. So the task is to give an image, generate a caption, or the reverse problem, given a um, caption, generate the image. And if you look at these examples, I mean, you know, you immediately think, wow, this is pretty you know, impressive. You need to write, really understand objects and scenes and you know, pose and angle. and you know, to be able to draw birds. I mean, this yellow bird has a yellow belly with um, Tarsus gray back and wings. I mean, that's pretty, you know, pretty intricate language. But, you know, at the same time, it's, you know, these models work because, you know, they're kind of using the standard train test framework where the training examples and the test examples, you know, are really kind of not that different. Um, so I think we should, can't be kind of, um, you cannot look at a kind of a, the behavior of a system on a single example to assess really whether a machine learning algorithm has, you know, done anything, you know, kind of uh, deep or not. So, so I think in order to use machine learning as a tool and to evaluate a property, you kind of have to speak its own language and you have to kind of think, you know, statistically, right? So, so I think today, you know, the, the, the paradigm is, well, you have a training set and we've gotten really good, I think, about not like training on our test set. And uh, so you have a held out test set, but I would say that this is kind of not enough to kind of make, you know, kind of meaningful progress. And I think hopefully we want to move to a world where, you know, you think about training distributions. And instead of having kind of a, a held out test set, you actually have a held out distribution. Maybe it's generated by the adversary, or maybe it's kind of a different task, which you maybe you even don't see. 
And that would really kind of force us to really think about, can I learn the kind of right concepts so that I can do well on these tasks? So maybe in the future it will be um, as ridiculous to just only have a, see a paper only evaluate on the test set as it is to only write today see a paper that only evaluates on the training set. So who knows? But I think we should, you know, just to kind of put things um, in perspective, we have to be wary of evaluation. And, you know, any evaluation, so Goodhart's law says that any evaluation that you come, come up with, anything that you can measure, it kind of ceases to be a good measure once you kind of define it because, you know, people kind of will tend to game it. Um, and that's, you know, part of, you know, the um, just human nature or nature in general. Um, so all of our c uh, code and uh, data and experiments are available on our uh, platform, CoderLab. Um, CoderLab is this, uh, just to um, say a few words about CoderLab, is this platform that allows you to upload code, data, and actually run, th uh, run experiments, which are arbitrary um, kind of Linux command. It runs in a Docker container so that it keeps the provenance of every kind of experiment that you did so you can have you know, guarantees of reproduci reproducibility kind of has this kind of uh, Jupyter-like notebook that uh, interface that allows you to kind of visualize your results as well. Okay, so with that, um, thanks for your attention. Hello, thanks for the great talk. Um, how would you kind of envision encoding this capacity for generalization into loss functions, which right now usually just sort of uh, try to maximize probability of you know the correct answer. Yeah, so that's a good question. And I mean, at a philosophical level, you can't exactly just no more than you can like incorporate the test set into your training. Um, there's another side of evaluation which I didn't have time to talk about, which is that some I mean the loss function now you mentioned is actually a really crucial point, and on some tasks such as, you know, in natural language such as, you know, dialogue or generation, it's not even, you don't even have to play these extrapolation games. We don't even have the right evaluation metrics, period, to evaluate something as complex as dialogue. Um, maybe another answer to your loss function is that uh, the first part of the talk when I talked about kind of making harder examples, you can kind of, um, there's kind of a duality between having kind of harder examples and incorporating kind of, uh, regularizers into your objective, like in the adversary examples work shows. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, the question is, uh, what are the connections of this work uh, uh, with, uh, with theory in, in, in machine learning? I mean, uh, the busy dimension of a problem, is this something that can be detailed from the point of view of back semantics? And even for the architecture, for example, the network you just, you just show for the, for the SAT problem looks very close to a restricted Boltzmann machine. Mm -hmm. So the question, is, the, the question in general is what are the connections there? Because for some of the problem, if the problem is super combinatorial, then it's very easy to catch a surface regularity that looks like we're going to get there. And if you try to attack that surface regularity, then something else is going to pop up because the problem is like that. So something about the underlying problem, is it relevant for this? Yeah, so to answer the first part, which is what, is, uh, what does theory have to say about this? Um, so most of statistical learning theory is um, based on, you know, VC dimension, Rademacher complexity, and, um, and all of these things is really addressing the kind of uh, train equals test setting, right? It's basically saying if you have enough data points, then, you know, by the you know, central limit theorem, things concentrate and you will expect to do increasingly better on your, your uh, test loss. There's some work on analyzing domain adaptation, but this is kind of more of a kind of extension or niche compared to the kind of the majority of most of our kind of understanding of you know, theory. Um, I guess regarding your other comment about you know, similarities between architectures. Um, so a lot of the, you know, the, both in the style transfer and in the SAT solving, these architectures are kind of very similar to things that have kind of, you know, been around. Um, so the, the thing that I was trying to emphasize is um, really kind of the evaluation. Like, when we take these architectures, you know, how do we know that they're actually doing something, you know, reasonable? And we try to choose tasks, for example, doing style transfer or solving 
harder SAT instances than the ones that we kind of trained on to really see if these kind of architectures are doing something you know, meaningful. And it seems like they, you know, to some extent, are based on our preliminary findings. Thank you.